Check it out. I will say we haven't been paid by McNeil or Rhino to kind of make Rhino inside seem like a big deal. It is a big deal, and we're not trying to choose Grasshopper over Dynamo. It's just a question of we as a group present information to you uh, the best way we can, and you know you make the decision as the person implementing any of these these tools. Um, with that said, so previously, many considered Grasshopper as a tool for designers and Dynamo as a tool for documentation. How will Rhino Inside change the computational frontier? Will Rhino Inside make Dynamo obsolete or will it enhance it? And should practitioners learn both Grasshopper and Dynamo? Can we display these prompts so others can see yeah, them? Let's, let me do that. And I guess any of you can start with. I mean, I would I would say like I know Raymond is very is much better at Dynamo. Like I'm not very confident in Dynamo, for example. And so I always you know run towards Grasshopper whenever I have to do something. But uh, like one thing that I kind of find very powerful, you know, using uh, Rhino inside is that you're able to manipulate all the parameters inside Revit, which is very important because, you know, whenever, like, the only reason why I would use Grasshopper and then bring something in Rhino is if I want to create, you know, some more complex shape because I just don't think that Revit can, you know, allow you to create a geometry on that level that, uh, that uh, Grasshopper can do. So I would always create something in Grasshopper and then, you know, load it in, in Revit. But you don't have control over... Um, much of the variables and you know the parameters that are very power, powerful in Revit. So I think like the wall that you ex showed at the beginning, the first uh, example by Zuby, like that's very powerful. And then you can't do that without, you know, uh, Rhino inside. Like there's just no way. You can just create a wall in, um, in Grasshopper and then create a wall by face in Revit. But it's not an intelligent wall. It's more like it's a surface, right? So I think that's the power, like being able to control all of these parameters between Rhino and between Grasshopper actually and Revit simultaneously. And also that one thing I like also with the Rhino inside is you can create your own workflow. So if someone's very good at Revit, but may struggle with Rhino and Grasshopper, well, you can still do a lot of the stuff in Revit and then filter it through so you can only do, you know, do just a small amount in Grasshopper to get that one element that you really want. Or, you know, me as a designer, I predominantly like Rhino and Grasshopper and use that more than Revit. So, but yeah. it's still with Rhino inside, I can still leverage Revit. So I can do most of the work in Rhino and Grasshopper, and then I can use that last bit of it and, and get it into Revit and get, get my documents set up. And it's, it's really different from, the previous plugins like hummingbird and where you're you're kind of forced in this workflow and you're forced to use these components that are sometimes not the best solution to to have that interoperability and um and it's cumbersome and you might have to do a lot of work around this is very flexible and you can make your own way of working and have that interoperability dustin had a really good uh question here uh, I said, do any local three-state radius um, architecture universities teach Grasshopper or Dynamo? Are Python or any other useful languages taught in architecture programs? And I know, Professor Ward, I believe you were on the call. Would you mind uh, sharing that with us? Lauren may need to unmute you for it. But can you describe what LTU is doing? Not to put you on the spot, Paul. Yeah, totally did that, <laughs> sorry. But it'd be great to hear from you if yeah, you're willing to yeah, share. Yeah. Is this, is this E word that I'm looking yes. for? Okay. Yeah. Is, I can. Is, can you hear me? Yes. 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 Welcome. Very good. Um, excellent presentation. Thank you so very much. Um, regarding the, uh, what's taught at the universities, I can't speak for, um, uh, for U UDM. I assume Michigan might. LTU has just undertaken um, a significant grasshopper rhino initiative in our information modeling and simulation class. And so uh, just a bunch of sophomores last year now, um, are well-versed in, in Rhino and Grasshopper um, coding. 
after one semester and are taking it forward into the design studios. Um, Python, not directly, but visual programming through Grasshopper a lot. Um, and this will only take it further. I'll be, I know I will be implementing Rhino Inside in this same class this fall. So this will go directly to the studios. Uh, surpri surprisingly, I can actually speak to you, Dees, because I'm actively involved with the Alumni uh, Association there and, and the Dean, and I do know that they have a, uh, like a year-long Rhino and um, a Dynamo class that they are teaching either the sophomores or the third years. What is also interesting is um, I also teach construction systems, so I'll be able to create a two-year-long workflow from Rhino through Grasshopper, Rhino Inside, and construction systems. Um, and so that's the immediate thing that I can do now that I couldn't do before this conversation. That's wonderful. Um, I'll add, uh, I know Penn State's architectural engineering program just recently announced that they're uh, developing a three-part series. I believe one and two are, are now happening where they have, everyone is now required to take a Python course. It's geared more towards computational thinking than to try to get you to be an expert Python user, just to introduce you to code logic. And then they have a second course that is focused on metric logic that uses grasshopper based um, workflows. And then there's a third program that's a little bit more Dynamo based, more Revit BIM centric. I would call it a computational BIM course. Um, and students who take all three will get a certain certificate but they are um, yeah, rapidly releasing um, these. And I was in um, LA and I, I forget the, the program's name, is it SciArt? There's an architecture school in uh, LA. Yeah. And then I walked through their building and I was shocked because the only thing I saw up on computers was Rhino and Grasshopper and every student had a 3D printer. And that looked completely different from when I was in school. So I think, yeah, curriculums are changing and they're changing quickly. Yeah, they, they need to change. <laughs> mm -hmm. I can speak um, for U of M, because uh, I know U of M teaches uh, Grasshopper Rhino for their designers. Uh, if you go to the undergraduate program in engineering, you do take programming. I don't know if that's required for architecture, but uh, it is possible to take it as an elective. So great, all these students are coming out with these amazing skills. What about all of us who are currently in the industry? It's a lot harder for us to learn. Um, I think the key thing in this prompt was, if you have to learn um, a language, should you learn just Dynamo or just Grasshopper, learn both? Well, how do people feel about the existing learning opportunities for uh, working professionals? I think you have to look at the divide actually, because um, Revit is a construction document program um, geared towards creating documentation. Um, so if you're going in, in, in as a project architect uh, and not a designer, it's almost to your advantage to be more uh, Dynamo centric. If you are going to be more of a designer, you, do, you don't have to spend a lot of time in construction documentation. It's to your advantage to learn Rhino Grasshopper. Uh, and then down the line, if you want to explore, then you can pick up the other um, uh, languages or visual programming. You mentioned pick up new languages. I would suggest that learning the first one is the hardest. Learning the next is much, much easier <laughs> because it's more of a mode of thinking. There's specifics about uh, the exact plugins, you know, that make each um, platform different. But I would think if you learn any um, scripting interface and you start to think computationally that's the most important thing so definitely yeah I was gonna say the same to this question of should practitioners learn both grasshopper and dino or only one a practitioner who is who has maybe 30 years experience and maybe hasn't touched any of these what would you say is more important for them to learn is it the tools or is it really maybe the thinking what, what do you guys think of that I think an another thing is also, um, I mean, not everyone in the future, you know, will know computational design, right? And not, not everyone needs to, at the end of the day, know. But if you understand the logic, right, like how I think if everyone should understand the concepts and the logic. So even if you don't know how to use Grasshopper, maybe there is someone who knows how to use Grasshopper. But at least if you're a project architect and you're, you know, working on a project, if you understand the, the logic and the thinking behind, you know, computation, then you might be able, you know, to find even someone who, you know, will 
make your you will find solution for the problem that you're trying to solve just by you know knowing how different you are thinking when you're coding rather than designing i think that's kind of the key thing because at the end of the day you know not everyone is um, project manager and not everyone is project architect you know and not everyone has the same role within the firm but uh, like personally i've seen that some a lot of people are not aware especially um you know, if you've been in the profession for too long, you might not be aware of what, what's the power of some of these tools, but you have the leading word in the, you know, in the, in the project. So I, th I think it's important to kind of understand how it, how it works. And then if you want, you know, to learn maybe Grasshopper or Dynamo, if you think that's going to benefit you. I think that mirrors what, what Zuby was getting at. If you've 30 years yeah. of experience, you might learn Grasshopper, but realistically you're going to be challenging yeah. somebody else to to do that i think the problem then would be do you know how to challenge them effectively and okay. in order you have to understand what's now possible um and what you should not be doing in order to look at your staff and say there's a better way i don't know how to do it that's your job to figure it out but i know there's a better way therefore i'm empowering you to go solve it without being unrealistic in those demands um i think that's sort of the the fine line yeah uh, I, I wanted to stay away from from Uber. Do you guys think with Rhino inside Dynamo is going obsolete? Rhino inside makes Dynamo obsolete. Yeah. Do you think uh, Dynamo will be going obsolete? What should take on that? Uh, not for the time being. There's things in Dynamo that work very closely with Revit, especially with documentation automation that hasn't been picked up yet by uh, Grasshopper. And I don't know if you need to because these tools work really well in Dynamo. Uh, and there's also things that you can do in Dynamo that, um, that people are already programming in that make it essential at the time. I think that's a strong case that Rhino Inside is not complete yet. And so certainly in the near term, there are things Dynamo does that Rhino Inside can't. I have a feeling that the network effects, uh, the more plugins a platform has, the more valuable it becomes, the more people become developers for that platform and it just grows and grows. Grasshopper was first. I think that's part of the reason why it has a more robust collection of plugins. And that's why I would find it personally more valuable for certain things. Um, now that Grasshopper is able to do a lot of the things that Dynamo can do, I suspect that pressure will only increase, making more people choose Grasshopper, develop more things for Grasshopper, um, which over time I can imagine diminishing the need to know Dynamo long-term. However, at a certain point long-term, there's going to be something else that replaces Grasshopper. So, you know, uh, but that's my feeling and I don't want to diminish Dynamo. I just personally would could see people somewhere in the world developing the things that Dynamo currently does and just making it, filling in the gaps that exist now in Rhino Inside. I think it's only a matter of time. Personally, I would expect that to be ironed out within two years. Any, any other thoughts? Is, is John here? Hey, hey guys, I also, you know, there's no, oh, sorry, John. someone is... So, sorry, I don't mean to cut you short, but... Hey guys, if you also have questions in the audience about this, like feel free to uh, raise your hand. Right. Yeah, sorry, John. Oh no, no problem. It's also if 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 there's a group of people who are who've already developed a plugin for Grasshopper, there's no incentive now to develop it for Dynamo. You know, before it was you know Grasshopper versus Dynamo, and it was like, all right, we gotta get on both sides and. Now it's just, hey, we can just use Grasshopper and it works fine in Revit. Actually, just to build on that, um, a lot of developers started not making their plugins in either platform, but just making them, uh, Honeybee went to a Python-based formula that allowed them to just be used in any platform. And I think that's what Rhino Inside is starting to get at, that platforms are going to cease to matter and that the source code will be interpretable anywhere. And it's just about building those bridges. Um, so we might, it might not really matter as far as, um, yeah, I don't know. I, I think you're right, Leland, because they, they might blend in the future. 
I mean, if you are uh, Python savvy and you wanted to push data back and forth between the two platforms, totally possible. All right, going to go uh, to the next question. Um, so what opportunities now exist to use Revit as a design tool? Should, should we still rely on fast, flexible tools like SketchUp and Rhino for design modeling and then transition to Revit for documentation modeling? Or does that distinction no longer hold? I think for, for me personally, like <clears throat> because of the power of Revit, like I'm trying to escape and use as less as I can Grasshopper to, you know, uh, model something just because Revit is I think the most powerful tool. It's just, you know, having the opportunity to kind of plug in Grasshopper inside, it's enhancing that power. But, you know, even at the beginning, I, I, I wasn't even trying, you know, to play with conceptual models in Revit because I was thinking, okay, Revit is not as good for that because it's not as good as uh, Grasshopper. But in terms of as you move, you know, in a project after SD, for example, I think Revit is kind of like, no software can compare to Revit. So I think Rhino inside allows us to kind of really play it, you know, the initial conceptual phase, which which is hard, which was harder, you know, without Rhino inside. But then once you move probably into, you know, SD, DD, CD phase, then Revit, you know, super ex exceeds the power compared to all the other tools, like SketchUp, for example. I'd like to go back to that question about time savings on this, because this is kind of like where in terms of uh, efficiency yeah. really hits uh, the, the nail on the head is that because we don't have to save and import the file, they can all be living in one situation simultaneously. You don't have to worry about that anymore, which is kind of like a time suck in the, in the past. It was a very manual thing where you work on something in Rhino and Grasshopper, save it out, import it into Revit, and then try to read, recreate the geometry so that the, uh, the Revit program can read it, it's, that, that becomes like a, uh, a moot point now. Uh, so exploring in Rhino with Grasshopper and then pushing it into Revit is, is a very doable thing. Uh, the question then is like uh, the software format from Revit uh, I mean, Autodesk, it hasn't really caught on that well. So I'm kind of like thinking, hey, it might be a good thing to do to just pick it up in uh, Rhino and Grasshopper and then push it into Revit to do the documentation portion of it. It's a cleaner workflow, I think. So it's an elegant thing to do. Do we, do we always need things to uh, happen in real time? I know the culture that we live in now, it's like instant everything. So what do you guys think about that? Like should, just because we can pass information in real time, does that mean it needs to be passed from your experience? Well, definitely instantaneous gratification. Once I see the object in Revit, it's a very comforting thing to do. Is it maybe more a question of, um, separating in our minds the final truth of the documentation model versus a sketch pad type model. Um, I've always been nervous about doing anything in Revit because I'm always afraid I'm going to ruin the truth, you know, delete something or, and the exact opposite holds in SketchUp because you're like, ah, it doesn't matter. It's not the real thing. You know, you can just play. Um, and so maybe it's speed is necessary if you're trying to explore. Right. Otherwise, it's you're, you've got you know it's just not a fluid design process. But if all you're trying to do is to update your documentation model, real time doesn't seem as critical so long as it gets done perfectly. Do you guys agree with that bifurcation of the final documented model versus a sketch-free design space? I, I think to even oh, think yeah. of the document as final might be a problem because we're dealing with data here. So it's, it's we, we need to transition to a mindset of data is dynamic. It's at some point you might need to refer to it. Maybe some other 
thing is pulling data from that source. So it's not, it, maybe it's final for that phase, but it actually has, you know, it's life cycle and it's just, you know, being used. So the finality of data, I think that's something you might have to adjust our minds to. I think. I think that's a great point. Yeah, I mean, there is a difference between the design model and the construction model that you're working on because we have to use a standardized uh, modules to build something like a four foot module and a two foot module and so forth. Whereas in the design model, it, it, it can be very rough. What we're trying to capture when we pull it into construction documentation is to grab the design intent, the aesthetics and the materials that were initially introduced in the design model and create something that's buildable. Because sometimes in structure, our tolerancing isn't to what, 30 seconds. We want to be right on a whole inch. And getting that, that live time, that live stream data and just being able to play for the design is very important because during the design, I feel like that's where things are the most liable and there's the most risk because you're taking nothing and, and creating something while construction documents, it's more of you're developing and honing and getting things more refined. So getting that instantaneous information of uh, running through thousands of iterations very quickly and, and just sorting out and thinking very big and broad. Um, it, this is where I, I think the parametric modeling, it just really shines that I can create, you know, I can create very fast, multiple iterations and start to evaluate them very quickly and uh, make the big decisions sooner. I will say for one thing, oh, you wanna go? Um, I just saw Adrian uh, had a really cool uh, point that he made here. He says, Rhino has always been very good at digital fabrication, which allowed for certain production efficiencies between Grasshopper, Rhino um, and the real world end result. With Rhino inside, will we gain that ability within Revit? I don't think so much. Yeah, I agree. Um, I, I think it stays with Rhino. I've always been uh, in my workflows is uh, if we wanted to create an architectural model from Revit, we would export that into Rhino, clean it up in Rhino, and then it would go into the 3D printing software to print out. But I think what he's pointing out now is that that connection always exists between Grasshopper and the, the robotic manufacturing. But now, because Grasshopper is within Revit, we could take whatever we have in Revit, whatever that final design is, and then in a similar way, pipe it from Revit through Grasshopper to the, uh, the robotic manufacturing that we have. It, it, I would I say, yeah. depending on the, on the complexity of the form, um, some things might just be better suited for Rhino just because of um, it's better suited for handling complex geometry um, as opposed to Revit. But there's some ways I've seen plugins out there um, in conveyor by proving ground. I'm not sure, I, I, I need to verify this, but they figured out a way to uh, really increase the fidelity of Revit uh, forms. So maybe that's possible to go back and forth. I can speak from my own experience because last term I had actually digital, not last term, in fall 2019, I actually had digital fabrication at LTD. And well, so at work, I'm used to use Revit all the time. And, you know, when whenever in digital fabrication, like I did not feel at any moment that I need to, you know, connect Revit with Rhino, just maybe because it was we always deal with something that's formally different, right? So maybe that's why I never, you know, needed to kind of use Revit to enhance my design, just because I could design everything inside Rhino and then just, you know, either CNC it or laser cut it or kind of, I don't know, it, it depends probably. It depends from the project. So yeah, yeah, it's yeah. tough that I don't even think, uh, you know, Rhino has that CAM software, you know, you can get a plug in, so it, it's, it's hard to find some reasoning of why you put it into Revit, but if you need something to reference, you know, it's great to like, okay, I'm going to take that shop file 
and I can put it into Revit now and actually have some kind of BIM characteristic with it, and I can start building things around that. Yeah, and we we still yeah, put definitely. things in Revit probably because of the documentation part of like generating drawing and all of that stuff. The moment we move straight from design file to some machine that's fabricating these things, all of a sudden you kind of think about how, not that Revit doesn't become important, but documenting the geometry that is already a file that the robot can read becomes like a, a totally unnecessary step. step. Yeah. 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 I just want to jump in. I'd love to hear from um, anyone else who's on the call. Um, <laughs> if anyone wants to, to just more actively join this conversation, uh, feel free, raise your hand, and we can make you a, a panelist, and you can um, turn on your video and come join us. I just want to make sure everyone knows that they're, we, we really do. I, we talk to each other all the time. We'd like to hear from you. So if you want to join, please raise, raise your hand and we'll get you added. If not, no pressure. Sorry to interrupt, guys. I can just start going down the line and make everybody a panelist. <laughs> I mean, I don't see any harm in that unless it turns into chaos. <laughs> all right, Adrian. Welcome. Awesome. Feel free to join us, y'all. Yeah. Um, a lot of the prompts we put together, obviously, these are huge run-on sentences. Um, we're trying to uh, to challenge us. Uh, so I think inherent in each of these prompts is maybe a slightly controversial statement. Um, it's something, so for example, when Zuby pointed out the assumption that we have a final document model, and he said, I don't know if that makes sense because it's constantly changing. Um, even this whole idea that we have fast, flexible design models, final models, um, got me thinking that in a world where it's all data anyway, and data is flowing and shifting from process to process, uh, I don't think that distinction holds anymore. Because uh, that might actually, it's funny because I mean, I think I was the one who wrote a lot of that question. So this is my fault. But isn't that kind of written from a mindset of desktop software? where a tool does this, another tool does that. And what Rhino Insight is showing us is that the tools themselves are less important because you can move information from one platform to the next. So it's less important. Yeah. And I think Zumi had a great point saying, if you're just sending it to the robot, you don't need to document it. So why would you, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. Well, I think, yeah, he had a great point. Um, this is Adrian. I just kind of hey, wanted Adrian. to follow up on my question. First, hi, thanks for throwing this together. This is awesome. Um, I guess my question was more so from the lines of, uh, like, I work in pretty much an entirely Revit-based office, and we're constantly coordinating with other disciplines. And many times, take, uh, for example, like a ceiling element, like um, Nada's restaurant or something, where they've got all of those like MDF cutout curves that you need to coordinate with other disciplines. And that's something that you very much want to produce digitally coming out of like something like Rhino, but you still need to coordinate with other disciplines, which wants to live more in a Revit environment. So I was kind of wondering about that back and forth usage more so from a coordination standpoint versus yeah, fabric. I can actually hit on that question. Uh, I had a project where we were doing these uh, uh, ribs in a ceiling, which had a profile uh, to simulate a uh, curve. And what we ended up doing was in Revit with Dynamo, we wrote a small script to take the geometry and flatten it and then put it on the sheets and then sequentially numbered them and then put it on a plan to, to automate the whole process. Uh, and then we would replicate that design over and over again uh, with uh, with the fabricator. So basically the fabricator got a CAD drawing that was uh, numbered and they could use that as a template with a scale on it to um, CNC out the uh, the ribbing. Is that what you were talking about? It's, I think that's one potential application. I guess what I've constantly run into with complex forms in Revit is it usually doesn't have um, I don't know how else to describe it, but the fidelity mm -hmm. that Rhino has when viewing complex geometry, 
but as architects and designers, um, we still need to obviously coordinate all the other elements. So I'm wondering how else can we lump the other disciplines into this while still having the freedom and the production qualities that Rhino and Grasshopper allows us? I think these are really good points, man. Um, I think something I'm hearing in between lines is that you're describing Revit less as a modeling program and more as a BIM model, right? A collaboration platform where all the different layers of information get overlaid and coordinated. Uh, and I think maybe it's just a matter of identifying what the purpose is of each location. So if data can flow between any program into another, and you're pointing out rightfully so the need for a central um, coordination place, which is what Revit is, uh, but it has limitations. It sounds like um, every discipline now has the ability and should challenge themselves if they don't think they have it to identify where they do, has the ability to work wherever they need to in whatever platform makes sense and just translate that data from wherever they want to be into the coordination platform to ensure that things align. So if Revan doesn't do high fidelity NURBS surfaces, use Rhino for that and bring it in through Rhino inside. Um, if you have some analysis program that you do your energy modeling or your HVAC analysis, how can you translate the outputs from that system into Revit so that it's in one spot for coordination? I see it as a data transfer question. Yeah. Um, but yes, I, I would totally agree that we need a central coordination place. I think I'll also say uh, to that point is, so talking about series, let's assume the series is you know, complex and obviously you're dealing with like mechanical systems and all that. Well, those things um, have metadata attached to them that can then go to the Rhino side and you can have certain types of coordination also happen on the Rhino side that's feeding information back to Revit, but you only take the data you need to kind of coordinate in Rhino and push that back and forth. So it's the intentionality behind what is actually the issue here and what do I need to factor into that complex geometry. Yeah, that, I, I agree with Zuby. I mean, we, I mean, a lot of times we do collaborate in, in within Davis Works or, or Revit, but in very highly custom situations, like working with Zaner, we actually, all our collaboration was in Grasshopper and they worked in Grasshopper, we worked in Grasshopper and we passed our files through that. Um, even with uh, the lighting consultant, they, they worked with us. Um, but there's also somewhere working with Fuchsis, uh, other coworkers where they've imported, you know, their Rhino, you know, Fuchsis's Rhino models and recreated them into Revit. Um, I think it just comes into, yeah, what's the, what do I need to do and uh, what's the, really the output of, of the project? I, I'm fascinated by that. I just want to point something out. Would you describe, if I, I'm, correct me if I heard you right, I was assuming coordination was a drawing-based setup where we have to have things physically overlaid in order to coordinate them. But when you're talking about coordinating grasshopper models, you're talking about coordinating logic right? It's not my design and your design happening independently. Your design is driven by my design directly through the code. If we were to say place your HVAC diffuser within the ceiling grid that I've designed, if you were to connect those grasshopper scripts, they would now be one script perfectly coordinated through the logic, not coordinated at all through different physical documents. That's a completely different yes. style of coordination. Yeah, it, and it and that was the great thing, and that was in this case it was working with Zaner where we were actually we gave them our Grasshopper file and they were able to start building their their structural models, their members on top of ours with their logic. And like what Zuby was saying before, do you even have a documentation model, or do you just send it straight to the robots? This is the same thing. You don't even have coordination PDFs. You don't need a platform for coordinating PDFs if you don't have PDFs, right? It's you don't even need to coordinate if you don't have a physical model, if it's all a code model. Yeah, exactly. Any, any more thoughts on that from the floor? Any audience questions, no? I can offer one uh, item just for the upcoming um, semester, again, from the um, perspective of an instructor. Um, frequently the students come to offices uh, as part of just sort of an outreach program during the year office visits. 
to the degree you can show them in the context of the office when they visit you, what it is we're talking about right now. It will be very helpful. I mean, I don't think we can force all that through this conversation, but there'll be better opportunities when the students visit your offices to really illustrate what it is we're talking about tonight. If you can put that on your list of items to do for the student visits, that'd be great. <clears throat> yeah, note taken, totally agree. I would also though flip that right back on any students who are here. The people on this call are those who are most interested and excited about this topic. Much of the industry is untouched by these ideas. And there is a huge opportunity for the students to enter these firms and to change them by introducing them to the ideas. So I totally agree, Professor Ward, that yes, we want to we want to show that here's how we're solving design problems. Um, but even those firms that are doing that, it's not, I can guarantee it, it's not 100% of the firm. It's going to be a section of the firm thinking and working this way. So anyone on the call, challenge everyone you talk to. If they're not doing it, show them how, because there's a huge opportunity there. Yeah. All right, going to our uh, uh, three. Uh, automation provided by Rhino Inside and Dynamo enable CD level document detail. High quality earlier in the design process. What does that mean for the project life cycle? How does that affect the industry and current business models? Okay. I have one thought on that. Just um, uh, there was a lecture um, that last week, Monday actually, uh, by uh, Rolando um, uh, at Mortensen from uh, Minneapolis um, regarding virtual design and construction. Some of you may have attended that lecture. I think it's recorded and available to everyone. But they're pursuing as a construction company a business model that um, dramatically affects, obviously, ownership of the, of the model itself and of the data and how that gets handled by a coordinator. And they're suggesting that large construction companies are likely maybe assuming more of the coordinator role that the architect has always thought that they did. Um, and so I do think that it echoes into professional practice also, um, as we teach it, but also as, as you all are experiencing it. Um, who is going to step forward and really coordinate the larger team, not just the professional team? Uh, any thoughts on that? That's a great point. Mm -hmm. because the truth is, uh, there is fight for data. <laughs> we vote from the construction side. Everyone needs nice data to kind of develop value from it. So, um, but as an industry, even recognizing the, the data, the way the data is structured, like we, we have issues, issues to that. But who maintains that? I think that's, I don't know. I, I actually don't know the answer to that, but it's something that needs to be tabled. I'm seeing it oh, manifest for, in. I was just going to say that for the, uh, for the project model or the BIM model, when the, uh, the physical construction is done and it's opened up to the client and they're having it, the, uh, the model uh, as we have it is uh, based on the way the contract is written we will give them a copy of the model um, because that's, it's just data uh, for them. If they want uh, an upkeep of that, that's a service that architectural uh, firms can do. That's, that's something to uh, lengthen the uh, project life cycle because then you can do like a lot of things with it for uh, operations and maintenance of the building in, in the long run. And that's another service that can be taken on, uh, thus extending the life of the, the BIM model. Um, I'd like to throw on top of that something that Leland pointed out, which is the logic model, which is a scripted program of how things were put together that can be reused to automate that whole process that we went through to do that one building as an automation for the next building that's coming up. I think that is kind of an interesting concept in that the time savings that you learned uh, in the first building is now documented in the script format of a program that can be passed on without the, uh, the, the programmer himself being on that, on that project. And it can be multiplied numerous times because it is a, a, a logic-based model that can be applied for data. Uh, I think that's kind of like a, an interesting thing to think about. 
Interestingly enough, that was one of the major takeaways from the information modeling class at Lawrence. The students felt more empowered by the logic model because there was durability um, and the ability to revisit um, design decisions and come back and understand them as decisions, as opposed to random one-off manipulations of, say, a rhino model that had no memory um, beyond what mm -hmm. you did last night. And so as a student mindset, that's actually also arising, the durability of the logic model. Cool phrase. <clears throat> I'll try to quote you on it because I'm going to use it again. <laughs> Durability of the logic model. Yeah. What about IPD um, in terms of early subcontractor involvement? Has anyone on the call dealt with early inputs from subcontractor models? Uh, actually, uh, yes. I don't know particularly about subcontractors, but um, we are currently going through a process, bring back to the larger question, um, for an IDP project where we're putting together a call it a technology engagement plan. So talking about who's coordinating, what's interesting here is that this is not a plan just for the design firm. This is the plan for the entire integrated project delivery. So contractors um, and this concept of big room uh, working where everyone who has a stake comes together in one big room to be open and transparent with their issues, their data, uh, their concerns, um, and all of that happens at once. I feel like that way of working works well for data transparency in an age where data matters the traditional bid build kind of process doesn't work well we have these huge silos of our information our data and i feel we're going to see more and more idp type approaches where you do have a single data coordinator that is allowing these systems to directly connect to each other yeah. and we're seeing it already and i think that's partly because we already have these tools and I think it'll only increase. Yeah, I mean, the, one of the big uh, pieces of technology is cloud-based uh, file sharing uh, so that multiple people, multiple teams can use and uh, edit the data simultaneously. Uh, I, w I wonder if uh, this is on the AIA or groups like the AIA to not regulate, but establish a protocol for the the data structure and just so that even though you're having like the um, IPDs, it's not this IPD A has a different structure and IPD, you know, has a different structure with the, the way the data is structured. It's a way that firms can learn from past projects and it connects properly. I don't know, I don't know if that. You mean common you data know. shared yeah, throughout the data, AA common professional? Data stru structuring. Um, in a way that it's not because it can be unique for projects, even though it's an agreement with the rest of the team. Are you describing professional data standards set by the AIA? I don't know. Some some type of protocol <laughs> mm -hmm. that's, that's uniform. Uh, I can tell you that the AIA would be hesitant to create any sort of nationwide protocol for that because every state's requirements and every firm's capabilities are very different. Now there, if, if, if you guys wanted to explore their technology and architectural um, knowledge group, there might actually be some data sharing protocols that are already happening freely wow. through there. And that would be a good resource for anybody on this call, um, whether or not you're an AI member, is to go to AIA.org and check out their technology and architectural practice knowledge group because there's resources abound on those pages. So you never know what you may find. And if this is something that um, I need to do further research and by uh, connecting with other AIA chapters, and that is definitely something that I can do on behalf of uh, Computational Design Detroit. Yeah, I totally agree because there is part of uh, the contracts where there is digital and technology agreements between the parties uh, when they uh, enter into the contract. Um, you know, some of them are like, um, like level of detail and um, uh, how formats are gonna be done, who and what is gonna be agreed upon, but that's the flexibility, uh, or at least that, that's a variable between the client, the firm, the architect, and the contractor. I have a question. How do other industries do it? <clears throat> I feel like I've seen a lot of open source 
platforms that seem to be agreed upon between Microsoft and Google and like everyone's collaborating on the same thing. Yes. How, how does that happen? And are there opportunities for our industry to operate in a similar manner? Or are we just too different? Uh, this is an interesting question. It's almost it's almost project. It's per project, actually. Yeah, that's it's cool. Who's, yeah, it's it's. I think I believe it's per project because it's 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 based on contract when you uh, when you write up the contract on who's providing what and at what format. I know uh, one of the things that uh, we typically do is we want everybody to be on BIM. We want everybody to be on Revit. We want them to be on uh, on version at least 20, 2019. Those are things that are stipulated in the contract. Uh, and if you if you vary from that that, that you, and you know you have to rewrite the contract or, or uh, make an agreement on who's providing what, but those are things that are, are in the architect's contract to the client and the contractor. I know the idea of IFC files was introduced, uh, trying to get everyone to kind of rally <laughs> around it, but it never caught steam. Well, then you think of the tech world and just JSON format, how powerful that is just for retrieving data, sending data, you know, there's a standardized format because they know down the line, this would help us exponentially as opposed to dealing with like the file. So that's why I was saying, who's the, who sets this? Is it just a round table that everyone comes together? Or like how, how does that work? Because we, I, I, I think the round table idea is probably the perfect scenario in, in my experience is we would get all the stakeholders together and then we would just knock out who's going to be providing what uh, in the contract. Uh, the, uh, the more forward thinking you are and the more accepting your group is, then the more progressive your contractual agreement will be. It sounds like this is the perfect kind of conversation for the National AIA TAP knowledge group. I, they're probably having this, have had this conversation. I think Lauren's right that we figure out them. what they've done. <laughs> well, I mean, don't ask me to figure out what they've done. That's where your expertise comes in. So y'all better get on there and join the conversations. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I mean, there is no chapter written on computational design. Like what, to what extent are we writing computational design? And to, uh, with that said, to what software platform are you going to be using? And what language you're going to be using? Uh, you know, are we going to be using Python? Are we going to be using Dynamo? Are we going to be using Grasshopper? What versions of the software are we using? Uh, what plugins uh, should we meet? Or at least what's the minimum requirement for that for interested parties to come in? Because once you get this written, then it's it's a domino effect. Anybody entering into it after you sign that contract will have to agree on these uh, on these constraints uh, as an agreement. Yeah, so now just to bring this back again, uh, how does that affect business models? Like how we think about doing business now that we are really, it's about data um, that affects how we work. Um, my, f my first thought right there, how does it affect business models, comes back to what we mentioned earlier, how if it's not about the final drawings anymore, our businesses are set up to make drawings. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, we do other things, but like that's our product. And if that changes and it appears to be changing quickly, that's got to have ramifications, yeah? Well, we have to monetize it too, because if we write a computational script that does a technology that exemplifies this uh, architectural design that we built, how do we monetize that? And do we have any licensing for that? What if somebody steals that? What if somebody, you know, how, how do we yeah. deal with that? So now we're entering into these gray areas or we just don't know we, we haven't been there yet and i think when we compare ourselves with uh you know microsoft or google uh, it, again at the end of the day they are product-based industries so like it's you know because where we are a service-based industry i think it's much harder to uh, even if you open uh, you know share and kind of open source a lot of things it's again it would probably depend from firm to firm and project to project. Like it's it's not as easy because because we are dealing with different you know uh, projects and clients all the time. It's not a product that you're launching out and you know and everyone is using it. Mm -hmm. I think that might be also a constraint. Here's a question regarding, and this is not to talk about standardization of um, the logic model. Uh, I think that might be a bit much to ask, but 
um, many initial people looking at, um, at visual programming um, canvases see a lot of free thinking chaos. It doesn't seem structured, which of course is quite different from what a set of working drawings look like. And so in a certain sense, our ability for drawings to be interpreted by others in the team runs into a headache when you've got a script which is spaghetti all over the screen. The ability of one programmer to get into the mindset of another programmer must have been handled by our large programming industries. So perhaps we can learn from other programming industries about how to make code understandable to other teammates. That's a good point because yeah. I yeah, speak I, to Python. Leland knows because we do have a format uh, in our in our scripting. We have a specific format that we should follow so that it can it can be almost I, I can't say it's easily done, but it can be readable for the next person coming in to look but, at that script. So I agree, but we made that up. I think what yes. Professor Ward's pointing out is I is an awesome point. You know, experts came up with this stuff for the tech world. What mm -hmm. are their code standards and why did they set them up and how are they designed? Let's not why are we reinventing the wheel? I'm not saying that obviously textual programming standards can be applied to visual scripting, but even take the basic premise of object oriented programming, that modular scripting. I know that so many of my scripts are totally not written that way. They're inefficient because of it. They're confusing because of it. And it could be, a, you know, that kind of fundamental change in our coding methodology. Um, honestly, I feel like if students are taught proper coding skills, right Right now the world is, is like this total wild west where a bunch of people taught themselves to code and we're all just barbarians in the woods coming up with our own ways. At a certain point, I feel like people will come in with uh, more refined techniques and everyone will learn from them. In, in terms of um, Ramon's comment about monetizing it, I think the cleaner the code, the more it looks like something that someone wants to pay for, so to speak. Uh, and, and so yeah. I'm not sure how you'd even approach that, but it, uh, at some point someone's going to start looking at our code and saying, yes, I'll buy that. See, I think to, to add to the point, I, I don't know that code will be sold. I think the value is the data yes. that's produced. Um, the code maybe for working together collaboratively, but I'm saying we produce tons of data in our industry and no one's doing much with it. You imagine Facebook, Google handling some of the data that we produce and tying it to some of your product line. I don't know what that looks like, but we have to figure it out before they do. <laughs> That's a thing. So I, actually, a very interesting outcome yeah. of the lecture on Monday was Morton and say, Mortensen saying, we're not going to keep the entire industry to ourselves. Google and Microsoft will take over a portion of our industry. Therefore, what are we good at that we can keep? Because yep. we're going to lose a portion of it. And so I think getting smart about what we can keep will be part of the discussion. I think the other side of the coin is that um, vendors or software vendors, Autodesk specifically, is working on uh, what they're calling a common data environment. So maybe it's less about what programming we can hand back and forth and how easily we can hand it back and forth and more about how we can make our own programming to interact cleanly, transparently with anybody else's data that's contributing to the, the design team model or to the overall you know, project model. I, I see that's where the vendors are leaning and, and it's, I think, infinitely more easy to uh, to create something that looks like that on, say, an Amazon cloud network. And then even what you were describing there with vendors being the creators of, uh, of the code, are they vendors doing that? Or is that what the architecture firms do? Or do we get rid of say, hey, we're not even going to try to learn to code. We're going to let all the vendors do it. We're going to let Microsoft figure that out. And we're going to only do design and leverage that other stuff. I feel like that would be getting rid of too much of the industry if, to take that stance. But Yeah, uh, agreed. Vendors don't have to lead it. But uh, they, if they make it easy to facilitate, then why not take advantage? Absolutely. And for an industry that, that runs away from legal issues, we're, we're in trouble, man. I'm trying to figure <laughs> this one out. <laughs> as long as we play within the bounds. 
yeah. because even though I'd probably say the reason why I, I I, I started using Dynamo and Dynamo was, again, it was like an open source uh, research project that uh, that was taken under the wing by Autodesk. It was a way of hacking Revit to do what we wanted it to do, given the creative things that we were doing with it. Um, so it's, it was still a hacking tool to me then and, and as it is today. So even though they are, they, they do have this product, it's still possible to, to crack it or make it do what you want it to do. So there's still that freedom of rambunctious dreaming to do things and get something unique. It's a, it's a human endeavor, I guess. Any, any more thoughts on the Rhino inside? And is, is Rhino gonna own Autodesk? <laughs> or Autodesk on Rhino. <laughs> the bigger gorilla. <laughs> well, I don't think the purpose of this meeting was to have any conclusive answers, but I do hope that everybody who joined uh, enjoyed the conversation and, and hopefully learned a little bit and was, was challenged. Um, I hope you're all excited about Rhino Inside. Uh, I think I can speak for all of us here. Um, it's easy to get into. If you know Grasshopper, Rhino Inside is the same thing. Um, so it's, it's, it's uh, accessible. Um, we got about five minutes left. So I just wanted to, to thank Lauren for, uh, and the AIA for always supporting us, for helping us set up this uh, Zoom call. Thank we like really, really appreciate all you do for us. Um, thank you to all the, the panelists and presenters and uh, all the participants who joined. Um, again, thanks for being patient with these virtual meetings. We'll, we'll try to get it back um, in person as soon as we can. For next steps, so this, is being recorded and it will be posted to our YouTube channel. For those of you, uh, you who didn't know, we have a playlist, uh, Google AIA Detroit on YouTube. You'll find the AIA Detroit's YouTube channel. We have a whole playlist of all of our past lectures. Um, feel free to check those out. This will be included. And uh, for next steps, we will have a September meeting. Uh, we have one of these quarterly meetings every three months. Uh, if you want to um, be aware of the next event that we have. Uh, be sure to sign up for our mailing list. If you go Google AIA Detroit and you subscribe to the AIA Detroit mailing list, there's a little checkbox for Computational Design Detroit. Um, I think anyone who's on here is probably automatically added. I don't know. I'll check that with Lauren. Depends on whether uh, or not they answered if they wanted to be added. Perfect. Fair. So no one's being forced into it. Um, but as we mentioned earlier, we are uh, going to be putting on an intermediate grasshopper tutorial that we're very excited about. We do think that there's a missing gap in um, a lot of the training in the profession where a lot of people get introductory grasshopper or dynamo. And um, that's all the formal training they get and the rest they learn in practice. So we've really tried to tailor this curriculum to that next level. So you understand grasshopper, you know a little bit about it, but maybe you've missed some of the finer details of list management, data trees, all that stuff that seems really boring, but is so necessary. We've tried to make it interesting and fun. You actually saw part of it, um, the script that Zuby went through for Rhino Inside. Generating that script in Grasshopper is part of um, the tutorial. So uh, keep your eyes out for that. We will hope to be releasing that uh, shortly. Um, and I guess for everybody at Code, thank you all for attending um, and keep pushing computational design at your firms. We are uh, changing the way we work, so keep on it. Thank you, right. everybody. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone.